Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Amazon QuickSight Fall Learning Series. My name is Jill Florent, and I'm a Customer Success Manager with the Amazon QuickSight team. And I'm joined here today by Allie Whitman, who's a commercial architect on our AWS Optics team. Our focus for today is going to be on building an enterprise cost intelligence dashboard. And what we're planning to do is um, be on the line with you for about the next 90 minutes. And we're gonna be going through an explicit set of steps to help enable a cost intelligence dashboard in your own account. Um, we'll be sharing the step-by-step -step instructions and giving you a demo um, of how to go through and think about uh, working through the steps. Uh, and most importantly, because we do have the optics um, lead here on the call, we're gonna be going through and uh, making sure that we're taking time to answer your questions that come up through the process and to talk to you a little bit about kind of how and why uh, this can be helpful for you in your account. Uh, I would just wanna call out that there are some prerequisites. So ideally, if you're sitting in on this, um, you're gonna be someone in a either cloud ops, technical or financial role with access to your AWS cost and usage report. And as you can see here on the, the list of prerequisites, um, this was shared for, with you on the registration page, uh, but there are a number of items that you'll want to have access to within your account to be successful in moving through the steps that we have in place today. Uh, I will be sharing in the chat with you um, the actual link to the steps in the dashboard. So that should be available to you now in the chat. Um, I also just wanted to mention that we will be uh, answering questions within GoToWebinar, occasionally uh, pulling up uh, sort of general questions for discussion with the group. I did also want to flag that um, we're not gonna be saving the written questions or sharing those with the group, but we will be recording the call today and ultimately putting the recording on our YouTube channel. And um, if you do want to ask general questions about QuickSight, the AWS service that we're gonna be working in most of the time today, I did wanna call out that there's a nice kind of Q&A community within QuickSight if you're in your QuickSight homepage, you can simply uh, click over in the upper right hand corner and click community. And that's a good place to post questions that you want to be able to have access to uh, after today. We also have links to helpful resources, including the YouTube channel where we will post today's recording. Um, let me just pause here for a moment and just give you a chance to, uh, to meet Allie, who's going to be one of our our lead uh, speakers and um, guide us through questions and so on. Ali, would you like to uh, share anything in addition before we jump into the overview? Hi everyone, my name is Ali Whitman and I am a commercial architect at Amazon Web Services. I work on a team called Optics and we act as subject matter experts in helping you identify ways to optimize your current and future cloud spend. And actually prior to joining, I was a customer myself at a large global media and entertainment customer. The cost intelligence dashboard came out of experience from working with our customers, as well as being a customer myself. I was always asking, you know, what are my, what is my spend? How can I better understand it? And how can I better enable my teams to take action and understand how to best leverage the cloud? And so what we created was the cost intelligence dashboard. This is an interactive, customizable, and business accessible dashboard to help you create the foundation for your own cost management and optimization reporting tool. This is meant to give you a starting point to be able to take something and customize it based on your business requirements. For today's, for today's workshop, we're going to be going over how to set it up. If you were in the first workshop, the first half of this is going to be a little bit repetitive. The second half is going to be looking now that you have it, what's next? A couple customization uh, pieces that we've seen from customers, ways to think about cost allocation, as well as ways to grant access to your team so that you can scale this reporting across your organization. So by the end of the, today's lab, and after you complete the lab, as seen in the link that Jill shared, 
you'll be able to create your own interactive, customizable Quick Sight dashboard that will help you understand your cost and usage. You're able to overlay it with what's important to you, whether that's your business units, segments of your business, adding cost centers or other information and metrics in. You're able to provide your team's cost transparency into the costs that your organizations think about and care about seeing. You're also able to break down your costs into how your teams need to see it, specifically giving them access to drill down into just their groupings of their cost. So without further ado, Jill, I'll pass it back to you to start the video. Hi, everyone. This video demos setting up the cost intelligence dashboard using the steps listed in the Well-Architected Lab. To get started, you first want to navigate to the Well-Architected Lab and review the prerequisites. It's important to make sure that you have completed all of the prerequisites prior to starting the lab. These ensure that you are able to complete the lab start to finish. Now that you've confirmed that you're ready to get started, let's continue with the lab. You'll see on the left-hand side of the console and the right-hand side of the steps. The first thing you want to do is request access to the template. You can request access to just the cost intelligence dashboard or all of the different templates. I'm going to request access to all of the templates. Now that I've been successfully granted access to the templates, I'm ready to move on to the next part of the lab. The next part of the lab is working with getting the views set up in Athena. These will form the foundation of your dashboard. Before getting started, you first need to figure out if you have savings plans and reserved instances. If you know of this ahead of time, you can skip this step. I like to complete it just to make sure that I know that I have them. What I'm going to do is copy over the queries and change the database and table name to point at my database and table name. You can see them right on the left-hand side. I'm running the savings plan right now one, and it will show me if I have savings plan by coming back with results. Since this came back with results, I know I have savings plans. I'm going to do the same thing for the reserved instances to validate if I have reserved instances. You'll use the knowledge that you get from understanding if you have savings plans or reserved instances to identify what view you'll need to use. We have views for all of the different options. So I have reserved instances and savings plans. I'm making note of that because I'll need it for setting up all of my views. We're now going to set up the five Athena views, starting with the summary view. You'll see the four different options there, and I'm going to select the one with reserved instances and savings plans. I'm again copying it over and pasting it into Athena. I'm making sure to change the table name following the directions in the lab. Now I've successfully created my first view. I'm going to run the check to make sure that it is created. So it's taking a little bit of time to run, but what you can see now is that it successfully created and previewed successfully. We're now ready to move on to the second view. We're gonna follow the same exact steps of using the same um, option that you have based on your reserve instances and savings plans and paste it over into Athena and update your table and run the query to create your second view. This view also successfully created now I'm going to show you a different way to check to make sure that the view is created. Rather than having to copy over the query, you can select the three dots next to the view and select preview. What you'll see is this automatically runs it for you, and I find it to be a little bit easier. We're now moving on to the third view. It gets a little bit repetitive, but we're going to walk through each of the different steps today. We're now making that third view, which is your compute savings plan eligible spend view, following the same steps as before. So I've updated my table name, and now I've successfully created this view. Again, I'm going 
going to make sure that it's successfully created and preview it. We're now moving on to our fourth view and are going to follow the same steps again. Reminder to always select the right views based on your reserved instances and savings plans and update your views if you purchase reserved instances or savings plans. So I've created that fourth view successfully and again previewing it. I have one more view left, and this view is the reserved instances and savings plan mapping. What you'll notice about this view that's a unique view is that there's two different table names where I need to add my table name. That's because we're joining data here. So make sure you're updating both of the table names using the instructions in the lab. I've successfully created my last view. And now I can move over into QuickSight. Now, once I'm in QuickSight, I'm going to take these views and create data sets from them. The first thing I'm doing is creating a new data set. And my data source is going to be Athena. So I'm going to name this, whoops, I'm going to actually name this cost dashboard to align with the lab. So now that I've created my data source, I now need to select my database. Again, you saw this at the top of Athena, so if you're not sure, you can always go back to Athena to confirm what it is. Mine is cur underscore sample. So I'm going to select the first view, which is that summary view, and click edit and preview data. The first thing I want to do is up in the query mode, I'm going to select spice. Now I need to update my payer account ID to change it to be an integer, as well as my linked account ID to change it to be an integer. This allows me to not have to worry about leading zeros in any of my mapping tables and having any issues. So now that I've done this, I'm going to save this first data set. Now I'm going to put a refresh onto it. So by scheduling a refresh, make sure I'm always getting the latest data. I like to set mine for before I come online in the morning so that my data is fresh and I know it's consistently updated a single time. You can also set your refresh to update multiple times a day or at the cadence that you need. I typically say at least daily though, to make sure that your teams are aware. I'm setting mine for 5.30 a.m. and I'll use the same time for all of my data sets. You can have different time granularity for each of your data sets. Again, this is all up to your discretion. Like we did with the Athena views, we're also going to create the same process for the other data sets. We're gonna use the same data source, the cost underscore dashboard. You can also create a new data source, but you can also still use the same existing one. I like to use the same existing one, but there's no impact to the lab regardless of what decision you choose to use. We're now creating our next view, which is the S3 view and doing that edit and preview data, changing it to spice, and updating the payer and linked account IDs to integers. Now that I've successfully done this, I'm saving the data set and going to schedule a refresh just as I did with the summary view. I've now successfully scheduled a refresh for my S3 view. Time to create my next data set. Again, I'm going to use my existing data source rather than having to create a new Athena data source, 
but you can follow whatever method you prefer. Make sure to change the query mode to SPICE and update the payer account ID and the linked account ID to integer again. Now I've successfully created the EC2 running cost data set and I'm going to schedule a refresh on it. This is all a one-time setup, so you only need to do this to get the dashboard up and running. After this, it's all automated. So we've now successfully created the EC2 running cost data set and refresh. We have one more unique data set to create. And again, I'm going to use that existing cost dashboard data set. What you'll know is that there were five views we created, but only four data sets. You'll see right after we finish completing this data set, what the last view is used for. Again, making sure to change it to SPICE and changing my data type from string to integer. This is for those leading zeros. You're always welcome to add another field in the query to have string as your account IDs, but you do need it for integer to set up the lab. Now I'm going to add the refresh again. I keep it consistent at 5.30 a.m. our time or Pacific time so that it's always refreshed for when I get online in the morning. So now we've successfully created the four data sets, but we need to update the summary view to join it with that RISP mapping Athena view, the one that doesn't have its own unique data set. What we're doing here is getting the reserved instance, reserved instance and savings plan information to map to the summary view. This allows you to see all the identifying information about your reservations and commits. So we're going to add the data. And then next we need to update the join. We're going to select the two circles and change it from an inner join to a left join. We now need to add two additional join clauses. And now we'll add our join clauses in. The first is off the ARNs for your RIs and SPs. And so for each of the fields, make sure you're having the corresponding mapping field to it. Next is going to be off the payer account ID in the corresponding mapping field. Now we're going to apply this. Oh, and I forgot to mention the last field of the mapping field is that billing period. After this loads, you're almost done setting up your data sets. Now you need to make sure that you always change your account IDs to integer. So scroll down to find your payer account ID mapping field and update the data type to integer. Now, once you hit save, you've successfully created all of your data sets for QuickSight. Now we're going to move over to our notepad and the command line because everything else to set up the dashboard requires the CLI. I like to use Anaconda prompt, but you can use whatever program of your choosing. The first thing we're going to do is 
to dis to is to list the data sets. This is going to give us the unique ARNs or identifiers for each of the data sets we just created. We'll need this when we create the template the template JSON later. So now that I've updated my information, I'm running the query now in the command line. And what you'll see outputted is a single example. This is a single example with my data removed for security purposes, but you'll see a similar one for all of your data sets. They'll be listed here with the data set ID and also the name. Make sure to note the name in this note sheet right here so that you can reference it later. Here's an example of all of my data set ARNs and the corresponding name next to it. Now that we have all of our data set ARNs, we're ready to get the next piece of information. And that is your user ARN. To get your user ARN information, we're going to run a similar command. What you'll see is I have another field now added with the user ARN. You'll wanna make sure that you also add this in and call out where it's from. We now have almost all the information to create our template JSON. This is what's gonna tell the template that you've requested earlier what to key off of so that you can create an out of the box dashboard that then you own with your own data in it. So now I'm going to copy over the JSON and you wanna save this somewhere where you have access to. So for me, for this demo purpose, I actually just saved it to my desktop so that I can easily navigate to it in the CLI. So now I've copied this over from the lab and pasted it into my notes. I've updated the account ID with my account ID information. I've updated the principal with the user ARN that I collected from the list user step. And now what I need to do is update the data sets with my specific data set ARN based on what I found in the list data sets. See how each of the templates has its own data set how each of the templates have their own data set placeholder ID, you need to make sure that you put the right data set ARN with the corresponding identifier. If you accidentally, uh, if you are, if you accidentally forget to add the names, I recommend you go back into the command results and get the names for the correct data sets because this can cause the lab to fail to create the dashboard. And then you'll need to go into the troubleshooting steps. So now that I've been able to see all this information, update the template, I'm now able to run the create dashboard command. So again, I'm gonna copy this create dashboard command like I've done with the other commands into my notepad and update it with my information. This gives me something to reference, but also keeps it somewhere I can easily update my information. So now I'm running this and I should see a 202, perfect. This means I've successfully created the dashboard. You want to then check in the console so go navigate back to QuickSight to make sure it's created. If it's not created, you'll want to follow steps seven here to troubleshoot. I can see my dashboard, which means I've successfully created the cost intelligence dashboard. Now there's just one final step to make sure that this dashboard is yours to customize and own. We're going to open the dashboard and we're going to update the permissions to allow you as the creator to save the dashboard. So what you need to do is go to share and then manage dashboard access and select save as for your user. You can hit confirm. You're the one who created these data sets as well. So now that I've successfully created and allowed myself to save, I can now save this as an analysis. What this allows me to now do is, is analysis is where you edit your dashboard. This is kind of like your working document. So you always wanna work off your analysis 
and then publish it out as a dashboard. This analysis is where you can customize anything. So now what I've done is taken a template and given myself a customizable dashboard and analysis that I now own. You've now successfully created your cost intelligence dashboard and enabled it to be saved as an analysis. So you have your very own customizable cost intelligence dashboard. As a next step, you can continue on with the lab to update the mapping tables or create the data transfer dashboard. Reminder, if you're doing this just as test to break down all of your work so you don't continue to have the, to have the uh, dashboard running if it's not in use. Please let us know if you have any questions or any feedback on the lab. Thank you. So I know this was a lot to go through and it went through very quickly. This, uh, the original session has the same video on it and it's on YouTube already on the link that Jill had shared. This one will also be posted there. But for the second half of the call, what we like to do is really dig into if you wanna go in and parallel and create this dashboard using the steps in the Well-Architected Lab, we're here to help and follow along. We're also here to answer any questions on how you can think about it. And so in addition to that, what I kind of wanted to do for this session is really dive into, you know, now that you've created the dashboard, what should you be thinking about? And a lot of that comes back to your cost allocation or your chargeback strategy. So I have some information that I'm gonna walk through on cost allocation and then share how you can implement how you can implement it into your dashboard. We also have someone from the QuickSight team joining to talk about access controls as well and how you can scale this to your teams. Perfect. So you should be able to see my screen now. And and this is just a brief slide we put together to kind of think about now that you have this dashboard, how should I think about using it and what are kind of those key critical areas to think about? Even if you're not doing chargeback across your organization, what you'll wanna think about is more of a showback. How do you show your costs? Because even if you don't bill out those costs to your teams, they should understand what their spend is and how as an organization you think about spend. This all directly ties into how you'll wanna customize your dashboard as well as who's owning it. The first pillar that we're looking at is management. And because management is so critical, we have Jesse from the QuickSight here, team here as well, who's going to be giving a little bit of um, information on the different ways to enable access for your teams. But the management piece is really going to share, show how you can scale your dashboard out. For example, who is responsible for maintaining and owning this report? Typically, with a lot of the customers I work with, they have a small team in their central consolidated organization who really own and have the ability to edit the dashboard. They're the ones who are taking in those requirements from the teams and making sure that it is something that scales, but also consistent and aligns with their organization's priorities. The next is the level of access. And how I like to break this down is think about the different personas that you have across your team. Within an organization, you'll have a handful of personas, but I try to group them into about three or four. You might have your leadership persona who really needs just that executive overarching view. You'll also then need your, maybe your FinOps teams who need some of those financial reporting, need to dig into the data, but won't need the ability to access and drill down into the specific resources. Then you're gonna have maybe your engineering and your engineering team and some of the other operations or SRE teams. Those are the ones who are really gonna need full access to dig into the data and some, uh, some organizations even give them access to read in the granular resource level data that you created your views from. So that say they saw an area where their spend was shooting up, they found where within the account it was at, they found the service, and maybe it had a tag on it. They were able to then go into the raw data and actually query to see what the actual resource was and how can they go about correcting it. We also want to think about who's going to monitor it. This dashboard should, and any cost tooling that you're using, should always be validated against what your spend actually is. So making sure you're aligning it with your bill, understanding that if you're allocating your costs differently, why there might be a variance, making sure that your teams understand what the cost value is, how the allocation occurs, and making sure that it's complete. So if there was a mid-month 
If it's mid-month, making sure they know that it's not finalized yet. The data will be updated and X time period is when your organization finalizes your data. We also want to uh, think about what systems you want to integrate with. We can do some really cool integrations and if you go through the lab, they talk about adding in some mapping documents but you can also integrate it with your organization, your AWS organization data. You can integrate it with uh, your trusted advisor or your S3 analytics to get even more intelligence. It's all about deciding what your requirements are and what systems are a priority. And finally, I touched briefly on this, but what cost value will you use? Are you using your amortized cost? Are you using your unblended cost, which is that invoiced cost value? Or are you creating your own custom cost value? I'm going to walk through one example later about a common use case we see with customers wanting to use the on-demand cost equivalent for their savings plans rather than using the amortized or the unblended cost value. They create that adjusted cost and then allocate the savings from their savings plans differently. Jill, I think we have Jesse on, so while we're on the management, uh, if he's ready, we can switch it over to him, and Jesse can give an example, uh, give some walkthroughs on the different ways to to share access with your teams. Great, we can see it now. Fantastic. All right, so th I think on the topics that we'd like to cover next are: I have this dashboard now deployed in my account. What are my options around how I might add other users and share the content and, and layer on additional security? I uh, just want to confirm that that's what we want to discuss, right? Yes, uh, specifically with Teams, Jesse, kind of how we work with a lot of the customers that I bring you into, you know, just how can they share it? What are the opportunities to scale it with their teams? And I think also talking about ways that you can have different real level security with data is something that came up as a question as well. Absolutely. Okay. Very good. So, uh, so assuming that we have this dashboard now deployed, uh, you will have uh, a the dashboard here itself, which you will be an owner of. Uh, up here in the upper right is where you would share the dashboard, and I know mine looks a little bit different than yours, but um, but but ignore that for now, just in terms of what the dashboard looks like itself. But once I come up to share and I say share dashboard. This is where I can start to type either other users or groups. Um, or we can talk about how these users or groups actually get added here in the first place. So if the user is not already part of the QuickSight account, they're not going to show up here as someone that you can share it with. So really the first thing that you'd want to do is uh, you would need to be an admin in your QuickSight account. You'll come here and say manage QuickSight. And you have a couple of options in terms of how do we add users to QuickSight. So the kind of quickest and easiest is you can invite uh, anyone you'd like via email. So you can come here to where it says invite users, uh, enter in any email that you'd like, and then you're gonna choose the role that you'd like that person to be. If they're just gonna be a consumer of this dashboard, then you can leave them to be as a reader. If you'd like them to also be able to maybe make edits to it or maybe even make a new dashboard someday, uh, you can set their role as an author. Uh, if you start someone as a reader, you can always uh, change them to an author later, but you cannot do the opposite, so just keep that in mind. You can't change an author to a reader, but you can change readers to authors. Uh, you'll leave this at saying that they're not an IAM user, and this means that they're going to receive an email invitation from QuickSight uh, where they'll click on the link, they'll set up a password for themselves, and then they'll be able to view uh, any dashboards that have been shared with them, and they'll be able to log in. If these users are IAM users, uh, you can set this to say, yes, they are, and then, then their way of logging into QuickSight is they would go to the AWS console first, and launch QuickSight from there. It's not required, but if you do have some users that already exist in IAM, uh, this is how you could also grant them access to QuickSight. So typically, it's probably not going to be an IAM user if it's if it's just someone who uh, doesn't access it, uh, AWS frequently. Um, so you'd set that as no. You would choose invite here. 
uh, I, I already exist in this account, which is why I'm saying that it didn't invite the user, but it's generally you see a, scene, a screen like this where it says, uh, great, we send the invitation to them. You'll be able to check to see if that person has accepted and, and finished the rest of the signup process. Like here, this, this user has already finished it, so the action I see is reset password. But if I had not already uh, activated, then this would say uh, resend invitation because uh, the invitations do expire after seven days. So if you need to resend it, this uh, that's how you can trigger that. And you can see the last time that that user actually logged in uh, as another kind of confirmation there. So that's the quickest way to invite a user is just invite them via email and they'll set up their own password directly for QuickSight. The other uh, way is that we can integrate QuickSight with your single sign-on platform. Uh, so whether, it doesn't matter, we, we should be able to integrate with anything that's SAML based. Uh, you know, really common ones would be maybe your organization is using something like Okta or uh, One Login or Ping or ADFS. Uh, all of those will work just fine. Uh, there is also on this admin page where you see single sign-on down here, where you can turn on that single sign-on capability. Uh, so you'll need to get a little bit of information from the team that manages the single sign-on platform. So it's really just these two pieces where it's the, the URL that we should direct the user to, to uh, if they're not already signed in, we can redirect them there so that they do the SSO first and then come back to QuickSight. And then this is just uh, the name of the parameter that's specific to that provider too. Um, you know, really common ones, if you go to the help area, uh, if you click learn more there, uh, sorry, I think I clicked on the wrong one. Here, where you say, what should I enter? In our help pages, uh, we have a table. That wasn't quite the right one either. I know it's in here somewhere. So here is where we're saying setting up service provider initiated federation. Uh, I don't want to get too technical necessarily right now, but QuickSight does support two ways of doing a single sign-on. Uh, this is the preferred way, this one where uh, it's service provider initiated. So QuickSight is, is equal to the service provider in this, and then the identity provider is your single sign-on platform. So this one is preferable because this means that someone could could click on a dashboard link and come to QuickSight. And then if they haven't logged into the SSO provider yet, we will redirect them there. And then once they're finished, they'll come back and they'll see that dashboard. Uh, in the other version of this, which is IDP initiated, it means that the user has to go to the single sign-on provider first before they come to QuickSight. Uh, so that's why we, we recommend this one. Uh, I'll put this into the chat area, but... Um, just so you guys have that. But then here you can see just some common uh, sets of information that you would plug into that admin page for some common providers. But as I said, as long as it's a SAML-based uh, SSO provider, and uh, really, really anything would work. So that's kind of what you'd be plugging in there. Um, so then at that point, once this is configured, then uh, anyone who has the correct permissions from your single sign-on provider, when they come to QuickSight for the first time, if they don't exist, then we're gonna automatically create a user for them. And they'll just tell us what they, we want, they want their email to be. And the email is just used if, say they want to receive an email report version of this dashboard, you, you can schedule things like that. You could say like every Monday morning, send me a picture of what this dashboard looks like to my email. That's, just, that's what that email is used for. Just wanted to uh, mention that. But then after that, then they exist as a user in QuickSight. So you don't have to pre-provision them or, or ever go to this manage users area. It just says the, as the new users come in, they'll automatically be created. So just to review that, the, the two most common ways of adding users, one would be just uh, manually inviting them using this invite users area. Or if you want to integrate with single sign-on, then you'll come down to this other section 
and follow the rest of the steps that, that we just, uh, just talked about. So let's assume that that's done, and now I have users in QuickSight that I'd want to go share that with. Then that's where you would uh, come back to kind of what I first showed, where if I go to any given dashboard and you come here to share and say share the dashboard, then as you start to type users here, then they'll start to, to show up. So that kind of concludes the, the couple of uh, tips and tricks on the sharing and adding users to your account side of it. Um, the other topic that we want to cover is, uh, you know, perhaps in your, uh, in your cost and usage data, you may have many AWS accounts. And those different AWS accounts may be uh, used by different teams within your organization. Uh, so an option that you have is we could set up uh, what's called row level security uh, on the data that's feeding these dashboards to say that when user A logs in, they're only dis able to see accounts A, B, and C. When a different user logs in, they can see X, Y, and Z. Um, so basically you're, you're, you are customizing what data is actually gonna show up in the dashboard depending on the user who's, who's going to view it. So to set that up, um, first you're gonna create a table somewhere. Uh, I'm gonna show you an example in Excel, but uh, and it certainly could be Excel, but more commonly this is something you would manage uh, in a database table somewhere. So how this would look is, uh, it's, in its simplest form, it just has two columns in it. One column, which is the, the username of what they uh, what it looks like in QuickSight for that username. And then the second is, what is the filter you want to apply? So in this case, I have a, I'm assuming that in my data, I have a column called segment, and that when Bob logs in, I want to filter segment equals SMB, when Patrick can see two segments, so, um, you can just comma separate values and it'll allow them to see more. Uh, in our case, imagine this says account ID, something like that. You know, we need to make sure that that matches exactly the same as what it does in your data set. Um, so this needs to say username like that and then this would need to match exactly the, the account ID column name. Um, and then this, you know, I would have a bunch of numbers here, right? And then if someone should see two accounts, you can comma separate them. Uh, the other way to do this is you can also just make more rows for that person. It'll do the exact same thing. So whether I have uh, this comma separated here, or if I take this one and put it on a new row and just write Sue for both of those two rows, it'll do the exact same thing. Uh, one other thing that you can do in here is you can make kind of a super user who can see all the data. The way that you do that is you just put a row for them, for their username, and you leave this filtering column blank. And then that kind of acts as like a star. It, it means that they can see everything. So for instance, you know, maybe you folks who are, who kind of own the dashboard and can see everything at all the, uh, across all accounts, you would just add your usernames with nothing there. Otherwise, you would uh, specify what you want to filter to using this. So assuming that we now have this table set up somewhere, as long as QuickSight can connect to it, we don't really care where, where it lives, um, you're going to make a new data set in QuickSight that is connected to that. So you'd go ahead and you'd make a new data set, and whether it's an Excel file or whether it's coming from Athena or a database, you would go and connect to that data. Uh, I'll show you, I already have one of those configured here. So this is my data set that points at that table. You know, we'll see in the data preview here, this looks exactly the same as what I was just showing you in Excel. So this lives as kind of its own data set in QuickSight. And then the only other step is on the actual data, like you have the data set with the actual cost and usage uh, reporting data in it. So go find that data set and when you click on it, you will see this option right here, which says row level security. So the only last step here is you click on row level security and you just point us to that other one. 
So here was the other one that I was just showing you, which has the rules in it. You click apply. Now those two data sets are now associated with one another. Uh, and then you never need to configure anything in QuickSight after that. So anything you ever have built from that data set or anything you build in the future that uses that data set uh, will we'll always have these rules applied. Um, so as I said, after after you apply this, there's really nothing else you, you do in QuickSight to maintain this. Uh, but as you want to add more users and more, or maybe change the rules, you're just going to do that in that underlying table. Um, but you never need to reassociate the, these rules to it again. We'll just, just make sure that the, that data set refreshes at least so that the new rules are in the, in the row level security data set, but beyond refreshing it, um, there's, you don't need to repeat this step particularly. So then at the end of the day, so say I go apply this. Now, um, you'll see that when you have anything that uh, is, has that applied, You'll see that that you'll see a little lock icon, which means that this data set has row level security on it. And uh, similarly, for any dashboards that are built from that data set, you're going to see that little lock icon as well. So that's just a way to confirm that you know that it's it's being applied. So that's really it. You know, you that's how you uh, apply the row level security itself. Um, and then when any user goes to visit that particular dashboard, it's automatically going to be filtered depending on those rules that we had that we had uh, defined here. Awesome. One last Thank quick... you, Jesse. Yes, <laughs> sorry to interrupt you, Ali. Just one last quick note. Um, where you're gonna get this username from, uh, it, the username will look slightly different if you're gonna do this single sign-on option. It's gonna wind up looking a little more like this user down here where the beginning of this username is actually the role um, that when we're configuring the single sign-on, there's, there's a role that the user assumes when they get to QuickSight. So it's gonna look kind of like role slash username. Um, but basically, it's it's still gonna look like that when you come to the manage QuickSight and uh, manage users console. So notice that some of mine you know, have this role slash username kind of format. And then I've got uh, other ones which just look like an email address. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter which one you do. It, uh, my point is that just in your row level security data set, make sure it looks just like uh, it looks in that managed uh, users page. So it needs to match exactly. Hey, Jesse, um, I wonder if you might be able to help respond to a good question that came up in the chat. Um, if you are using um, SSO, is there a way to dynamically add users to the row level security based on AD groups? Yeah, that, that is a good question. Um, QuickSight can be configured with AD. So that is a, a, another option. You would need to configure that when you're signing up for QuickSight. So that when, you, when you first set up the account, you can choose whether you want to use uh, Active Directory or whether you want to use like this combo of having email addresses and or doing single sign-on. Um, but assuming that you did set up AD when you signed up for the account, then your road level security could also just work on a group level. So I showed you an example at a user level, but it does also work at a group level. The only thing that changes instead of username as your column name, it says group name. Um, then there's really no management that happens after the fact unless you need to add new rules. But you know we're saying that this en entire enterprise group gets to see this filter. And then as new users get added or removed from your AD groups, you don't need to touch anything in QuickSight. It'll just, uh, it, we kind of have like a real time connection to your Active Directory at that point. Um, so this is an even better way of doing it if you do use Active Directory and you want to integrate QuickSight with that. Um, you can also recreate groups even if you're not using Active Directory. So while they come kind of natively if you use uh, AD, uh, even if you don't use AD, you can create groups out of these users in QuickSight, whether you were using single sign or just in inviting them via email, doesn't matter. 
So like if I just have users kind of like you see here, uh, I can create groups out of these and similarly use them in that in that row level security data set and, and mention the group names. But the, the, the way you manage those groups is using our API. So similarly how you use the API to get the dashboard into the account and in, in, your, in your account in the first place. Uh, there are similar uh, API calls to create groups and to add users to those groups. So here there's, uh, the first one you would use is called create group membership. And basically you're saying create a group and then here is the name of the group. Um, and then once that group is created, or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, I made a mistake. The first one you do is called just create group. That's the one where you're just saying, here is the name of the group that I want you to create. And then after that group's created, then you, you run this one, which is create group membership, which says add this user to XYZ group. Once you do this, you know, via the API or the command line, and you have those groups, you have users in those groups, uh, then everything that we said about uh, using groups to manage this is, is still true. Like I can use my row level security at a group level. Um, I can share assets at a group level. So rather than when you're going to share that dashboard, like previously I had typed in usernames here, but I could, I could also type in the name of a group and it's gonna show me any groups that match that as well. So like I created these groups using the API, I added some users to them, so I can share my dashboards with them and I can also leverage it through the row level security too. So apologies, it was a long-winded answer, but uh, <laughs> hope, hopefully that answers it. If not, uh, you know, please let us know and we can follow up with you. Yeah, maybe um, just to tie off on this one, there's probably some documentation that we could add to the chat that would help with the, the group APIs. Uh, maybe you could add that just to the general chat when we're done with that. Certainly, yep. So here's... Okay. Those would be the two commands you would run if you want to create and manage groups if you're not using Active Directory. If you are using Active Directory, and, and remember, you need to configure that when you first sign up for QuickSight, um, but your manage users page looks different if you're, if you're uh, using Active Directory. You never actually see any particular usernames. You're going to see like three boxes here. One for what groups do I want to be admins? What groups do I want to be authors? And what groups do I want to be readers? And then that you're, you're just telling QuickSight kind of what groups we should sync with. Uh, and then from that point forward, you can use the groups or the usernames to share and, and for the security aspects. Awesome. So if, if you Thank hadn't you. configured for AD, but you do want to turn that on, you can unsubscribe from QuickSight and then resubscribe and, and, and configure it for AD instead. And then we would just kind of rerun the same steps from earlier in this workshop where we're copying that dashboard in. Because when you unsubscribe, you do lose the content from that account. Um, so just be aware of that. But you can unsubscribe and then re-sign up and configure it for AD and then just re-import the dashboard. So that, that should work just fine. And Jesse, we had a couple questions too, and I think one is kind of going off of the segments, how you use segments. Uh, folks are interested if you can use other tags as well, it, or does it have to be segment? I believe you can use any of the tags as well. You can use whatever, as long as that column exists in the data, you can definitely use it here. So whether it's the account ID or a certain tag that you've already pre-configured, um, by service name, by region, anything that's in the data set, you'd, you'd be able to use. Just just make sure that you make the column name match exactly, and then you're good to go. Yep. And, you know, here we're that's just saying like there's one filter column. If if you need to, you can create more. Like say, uh, like combinations of filters. So I could say. Uh, that when Bob logs in, Bob should only see this account ID, but also only this region. So you can do like combinations of filters if you add more columns. But at minimum, awesome. you would just have one. 
and and this is actually something that I have a couple customers right now who actually use their organization's data and pull that into their QuickSight dashboard. So they put it into their Athena views and they actually will map off either their organization or the tags within their organization. And so that's another option that we see very common with customers to, to scale it with what's actually linking back to their accounts. And the other question that we had on was about embedding. And folks are wondering is if you have embedded the dashboard in external site, is it possible to set up the security level based, uh, the security level after that embedding step? Um, yes, the, the order of how you do it doesn't matter. If, if you've already embedded the dashboard, you can set up the row level security after, that's totally fine. Uh, or you can set up the row level security and then choose to embed the dashboard. Those are kind of independent from one another and you could, you could set either one up whenever you'd like. Awesome. And, and folks, the reason I wanted to have Jesse join on and really wanted to target this in the call is a lot of times, you know, you have this great dashboard now, but how do you scale it? How do you make sure your teams get access and, and you enable it in the way that scales with your organization at the start so that you can continue to iterate and customize rather than have to go back and look at how do I now grant access? So Jesse, this was extremely helpful. And, and I think I speak for everyone on the call that they've gotten a lot of information. We had a lot of great questions come in. So I really appreciate you walking us through all of this. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. So I'm going to take over sharing again. And there was a question about tagging and it actually will be really helpful to relate it back to exactly what Jesse was just sharing as well too. So I'm gonna change myself to make myself the presenter. Perfect, so we, this slide looks familiar. It's the same one we were on earlier, but I want to you know, shift over to the tagging bucket. Now that you have that management, there was a question that came in is, can you add your tags into your dashboard? Uh, can you add tags to assign your different groupings? And the answer is to yes to all of that. And so this dashboard is meant to be completely customizable and to, for you to add what's meaningful for you into it. So it can be tags, it can be your organization mapping, it can be anything. So what I'm going to quickly show is just how you would kind of go about adding a tag here. This is all dummy data. And so I won't be able to load it into the QuickSight dashboard because it won't populate through. But this view looks familiar. If you were watching the video earlier or created the dashboard, you go into Athena to create your different views before populating those data sets. So let's just say that I want to go in and um, update my views to include one of my resource tags. What I can do is show and edit my query. So now my query that is pulling into my, da uh, into my dashboard is now up. What I can then do is decide what tag value that I want to add into it. So let's just say here, and to, a quick way to look at all your tags is to type in the keyword resource underscore tags, and it'll pop up all of your tags that you have. So now I can see all the tags I have and I can decide which one do I want to add into my uh, view. What you would then do is add it into their query. You'll want to do this into all of your different views. You do not need to do it in the reserved instance and savings plan mapping view though because it's already in the summary view when it pulls in. One thing to always keep in mind, and this is important for adding in any views into your, um, into your dashboard, any additional fields is, if it's not an aggregate field, so meaning it's not a sum, account, or something that's calculating, you'll want to add it above those. It makes it easier to add those group buys, which define the non-calculated fields in your data sets. So I always like to use my first sum field or my per first count field, or you can also just do it straight at the top. So let's just say that because of order of operations, and a really common place to put it is under a linked account ID. So what you would then do is just add it under your linked account ID here. So I'm gonna add in my resource tags user product. I can actually just double click on it and add it in. One thing that you'll notice is when you do the double click method, 
it'll add an extra comma. Make sure you remove that. It'll also tell you in an error message if you didn't remove it and so that you can correct it and then rerun it. You know, Resource Tags User Project is kind of a long name for me. So rather than calling it that, I'm gonna call it Let's call it tag underscore project. And if you have multiple tags, uh, labeling them as tag underscore first will help them keep them organized in your data set as well. So now that I've had this and I've added this in, what I need to do next is just add another group by at, at the bottom. So I added another field. So now I just need to add another group by. And after doing that, you would just click run query and it would now be updated. If you want to see it immediately in your data set, what you would do is go into QuickSight and do a manual refresh of your data set. Or if you want to just wait until your next refresh period, you can wait until your next refresh period and we'll pull it in. So that's how you would go about adding your tags in. And you can do this with tags. You can do this with other fields in the, in the cost and usage report or any of the other meaningful data. Just a reminder, to, if you're going to do it to one data set, do it to all of them so that you can use that grouping, uh, grouping criteria that Jesse mentioned for access, and you can also use it to now toggle down into your data and filter based off uh, a field across multiple data sets. So going back into Kind of the things to think about. So you have your tagging in there. You can add your tagging in. So now you've had your tagging included. You can create custom fields off your tagging to add into the dashboard. And, and now let's think about now your reserved instances and savings plans. This is one that's become a really big topic among a lot of the customers I work with. And I know I've heard it across a lot of my coworkers that reserved instances and savings plans and how allocating costs, uh, allocating their costs is something that is being commonly asked. We're going to go over a couple use cases, how you can allocate your cost. The dashboard by default gives you two options by using your cost unblended, which is that invoiced cost, or that amortized cost. The cost underscore amortized is essentially taking your reserved instances and savings plans and spreading them out across the duration of their, of their reservation. So rather than having it up front or a um single fee attached to who purchased it you're actually able to see who used it and the costs associated with with the uh, usage applied actually to that field rather than just an account level one thing that we've seen very common though specifically with savings plans is customers are doing more of a consolidated approach with savings plans sometimes they'll purchase at either their consolidated master payer account level or in a standalone commit or reservation account where they'll purchase, purchase a com, compute savings plan that they want to allocate across all of their organization. What you can then do is decide how you want to show that cost value. A lot of customers want to show it in a way that it looks like it was the on-demand cost equivalent of it. Because it's a consolidated one, you know, they really want to show what was the on-demand cost because the savings aren't, aren't going to be shared evenly across their team. So they want to actually remove those savings out and share it with teams based on their own criteria. What they then do is are you're able to adjust your cost value in, in the QuickSight dashboard. So let's walk through an example on how you would go about doing that. So on the billing summary page, let's just say that you wanted to create a cost value that takes your savings plans and changes the cost from looking at it from a cost unblended or your invoice cost and the cost amortized to a completely different cost value. And this is a great way to also learn how to add additional customized fields into the dashboard. But what you'll do is say add calculated field. What we're gonna call this is, let's call this as our cost underscore build. And this is what we're gonna build out to, build out to our teams. What you then wanna look at is, now how would you go about getting this in. And I am very Excel-based by background, so I think a lot of this back to if I was in Excel, what would I do? Uh, it actually has a lot of, of the same overlaps and how you can think about the formulas. It tells you exactly the inputs you'd want to put into it and exactly what you want to roll uh, rolled over. 
one of my favorite ones to use is this if else. And the reason for that is it's, a, it's an if then statement. So I'm basically able to say, if it meets a certain criteria, pull something in. If it doesn't, take this value. So let's just say that we do this if else, and we now want to do it for showing savings plans as the on-demand cost equivalent of it. What we then would do is, instead of having it just be as the straight cost value, what we now would do was say, if else, and here's a list of all our fields, so what do we want to define it by? We want to define it by our purchase option because that's going to tell us if it's a savings plan or not. So if it's a, let's do if else and purchase option, and if it's a savings plan, Let's take the public cost. If it's not, let's take our cost unblended. And so you're able to create your own view of what you'd want it to be. And let's now hit save. And so now I've created my own custom cost value. We see teams using this to create their own allocated cost models. We see folks using this to make, make something that's custom to them. And I always say sky's the limit. How I recommend doing it, so say this wasn't the method that you'd want to go about and you want to do something slightly different than the cost amortized or the cost unblended or this build cost we just created, what I recommend is going through and writing out what your requirements are. You know, I want to see the cost values based on these fields for this scenario, but everything else, it needs to be this. I want to split these charges. And you'll be able to create your own requirements list, which then says, okay, now I have my requirements and I have all the data here. What do I need to, what do I need to adjust to make it my own? You're then able to create your own cost value and update any of these dashboards with your specific cost value. And I actually just see a question coming in. And it says, what will public cost be when purchase option is not savings plan? So public cost, because what we're doing is as an if else statement. So in that cost build, if I go back into this cost build here, what you can see is if my purchase option isn't savings plan, I'm if my purchase option is savings plan, I'm taking the cost public. If not, I'm taking that cost unblended. So it's going to take the cost unblended. One call out is the cost underscore public should really only be used to look at your savings plans and reserved instances, or you should do a test in, in Athena to see what values it's available for, because the public cost is not available for every single field in the cost and usage report. So you want to make sure you're using it in a way that's meaningful, but also accurate. So I like to use it just for savings plans and for reserved instances. So another question about public cost. So public cost is the on-demand cost equivalent of it, so um, or the, the on-demand cost of it. And so it's that pricing underscore public on-demand cost in the cost and usage report. And one thing that you'll see is, so for example, reserved instances and savings plans, you'll see the on-demand equivalent of that cost. So it's really helpful to use to identify your savings, to identify what it would have, what your spend would have been uh, if it was on demand rather than the applied savings plan or reserved instance cost. That's how I like to use it for. But say, for example, um, you want to open up to more services. I always say the best thing to do is do a select star from. And that's in Athena so that you can see what's available to you. You can then download it and you're able to see exactly what you need to see. And Joan, I think you had posted there was an error in there, yours. So I'm just looking at yours now. And if folks are trying this on their own too, um, I can post in the formula that I have so that you can edit it as well, just to see. Typically what I'm seeing in this one is it looks like you're missing your end, your closing parentheses at the end. So making sure that if you have an open parentheses, you're closing it at the end in the, in the calculated field. So let me paste this into the chat so that everyone can have this as well.
Perfect. So I pasted that into the chat so that folks will now have it. So now let's say that I wanted to create a, a chargeback table, something that I can either download to Excel, share with my teams, and have them use it as the source of truth of what they spent in a month. Because a lot of times when you get started with a dashboard, what you want to do is automate some of the tasks that were more manual for you, because that gives you the ability to customize and spend more time gaining additional insights rather than having to continue to do some of those more manual tasks. So creating an automated chargeback is something that we see is very common. So what I like to do is create a new view. And what you can do is there's a few ways of going about it. If there's a view that is already filtered and it has a lot of the information you want, what you can do is click on the bottom of it and duplicate the visual. That's really great for if you're looking at a visual in another tab in, or another sheet, for example, like the Compute Summary tab, and it has some of the EC2 cost data already, already filtered together. You can duplicate that so that you keep all the filters. But for this use case, because it's build, we don't need to use an existing dashboard or visual. So we're going to add our own new visual. So if we were going to go off that build cost, let's just say that I want to do this off of the cost build. I want to look at it over my different billing periods. And I also want to look at it by one of my mapping tables I brought in based on the mapping CSV from the second part of the lab. I'm going to bring in that cost center team. So now I'm able to give myself a view of my cost month over month by how I'm allocating it out to my teams. And this is using that build cost value, and I'm able to see it for each team. Let's say now when I send out my uh, chargeback or my monthly summary to my teams, I need to also show them what services it's from. You can then add in the service underneath this so that now you can see your service and you can also see your cost by your services. You can expand or collapse it all. So for use of the screen, I'm going to just collapse it. So now I want to just quickly share this out to a team member who asked a question about their spend. What I can do if, is if they need to go more granular and you know, need to send it, say, to someone on their finance team who needs to aggregate it with their other bills rather than just seeing it in this dashboard, you can export it to a CSV or export it to Excel. We have a lot of customers who actually use this today to create their custom cost allocation, and then they actually export it out into the team who does their invoicing. So they actually send out their final bills based on what the co cost they have allocated using their dashboard in QuickSight. Another really cool thing that you can do with the dashboards is adding some of those metrics in there. So what's meaningful to you? I was actually talking to a customer yesterday about their 2021 strategies. They were looking at wanting to have all of their teams start to adopt a certain level of coverage as reserved instances or savings plans. And so what we kind of talked through is, you know, what is it that they're looking to do? What it really came out to is they didn't want to have any more than 20 to 30 percent on demand coverage for any of their EC2 usage. So what that meant is that they wanted to look across their organization and see if there was an easy way to tell what coverage level their different teams had based on those sub accounts. So if you can see here in the compute summary tab, there's a really good getting started view where you can see this for each of your accounts month over month and see what the different purchase um, purchase model coverage is. But they really wanted to get a just a quick view of their on-demand coverage only and be able to color it, a color code it with conditional formatting so that they could see where they were trending. So what we worked with them on was let's look at how we can take this visual here and customize it to make it something that they wanted to see. So we worked together to then say, let's duplicate this visual. As I said, if there's already filters on it, you can just duplicate it. And so we now had all of our filters for the coverage that we needed. But it didn't really have the values that we wanted to see here. 
they only wanted to look at on demand. So what we worked with them on is let's create a custom calculated field like we had just done for that cost underscore build. We're going to call this, uh, let's just call it percent coverage on demand. So now we're only looking at on demand coverage. What we then want to do is similar to that if else, we need another if statement, but we're using, let's use something that can be more of a sum. And so what we did was take that sum if statement here, and we did if we wanted to do our cost value. So the cost value is what we want to sum. And we only want to sum it if our purchase option equals on demand. But this is just going to give me the cost of my on demand. What they really want to see is what percentage is it, is it of it. So let's now create a larger statement over this. We're now going to divide this by all of my sum of my cost. So what we've effectively done here is created a single field that they can then use conditional formatting on to create a quick way to look at their on-demand coverage to see what teams are tracking to their desired goals as an organization. So now if we save this, we can then continue to edit this view. So rather than looking at it by purchase sauce option, let's look at it by my account. We also want to change it to be a pivot table because I want to see it more in a view that's a little bit you know, more table-like for me. We can then move our billing period over to the right-hand side so that I can have it in the columns. And this is going to be where I'm now able to start adding in the fields I want. Right now, we have our percent coverage. But we want to use our percent coverage of on-demand only. And you can come up into here to change the formatting of your numbers. I always say the format of your numbers that you want to, or your values that you want to use for 95% of your use cases, adjust it in the field list. But if it's a one-off, adjust it in the values because it will only hold true in that one single visual if you adjust it in the values. So I want to change this to an a percent. And so now I'm able to see each account and my percent coverage. But I also wanted to see it color coded. So let's just say I wanted to now quickly give a view of what I'm trending and add some conditional formatting in so that I can see some green if it's doing well, if it's below where it should be, have it highlighted as yellow. And if it's a you know well above on demand coverage of 20 to 30 percent, let's color it red. What this does is give me a quick view of being able to see what's happening. So I add my percent coverage on demand, and then I add my icon set. I'm going to do circles. We didn't want to do our custom conditions. So the first one is my requirement. My requirement is, is if it's between 20 and 30 percent. So 0.2 and 0.3. If it's yellow, that's when I said it was going to be less than 0.2. And then anything else, so anything greater than 0.3 should be red. So now basically what I've said is our, our organization has a goal of 20 to 30 percent coverage of on demand. That means everything else should be covered with either savings plans, reserved instances, or spot. This will help keep our pricing in check, but make sure we are having the lowest amount of unused portion of our cost. So it was a question on how I got into this formatting. So to get into conditional formatting, you click on the three little dots under here on the visual and select conditional formatting. So now what I've been able to do here is see a view of my month over month coverage for my on-demand EC2 usage by each of my accounts. What this now gives me 
the ability to do is to look at and say, in October, I only had one account trending where they should be. I'm going to go talk to them to figure out what they were doing, how they identified their use cases to be able to make these purchases or leverage the different pricing models. And I'm going to then work with the teams who aren't hitting their goal to figure out how we can help them get to their goal or reevaluate why they would need to adjust their, their goal of that 20-30% to something different. This is just one way that you can use conditional formatting. You can also add this into your reports. You can add in budgets. There's endless possibilities. One other thing that you can do too, as we're going through, is we talked a lot about the different tags and the different groupings. So let's now say that you've added in a tag or a business unit grouping based on your mapping documents or added to your queries. What you can actually then do is add it to the whole sheet here. So I want to add a, to my compute summary tab. I want to add a filter to it. And so I also want to put this in my whole sheet. So what you would do is you'd create a filter for it. And if you do all applicable visuals, what this will do is it will look across all of the visuals here, not just the ones that are using the summary view data set. It'll use all of the QuickSight data sets that have a corresponding mapping view to it. This is super helpful to limit, to lower the amount of data you need to bring in to keep performance high, but allow you to group data across multiple data sets. So now that I've created this, you know, I want to add it to my sheet because this is something that's really important to my organization. I can now add it to my sheet and you'll just see as it drops down to the bottom. You know, I kind of prefer it at the top because that's the first place my teams are going to look. So I'm going to pin this to the top. And now what I have here is a cost center team. Right now it's defaulted to all. But let's just say I only wanted to look at core apps. I'm able to click on this filter and see it for just the core apps. So now I've been able to create these different types of customizations within it. And these were just a few that I wanted to show that I think are ones that really help customers get started and really help you start to think about how to use the different features in QuickSight, but also how to think about how you can leverage what's in the dashboard to customize it to make it your own. So we went through a couple examples here. And again, I always say, exp uh, you know, put it into your own requirements. Start to think about what you wanna see. And, and me personally, I'm someone who always second guesses and I don't want to mess up the visuals that I've already created in the sense that if my teams are using this, I don't wanna over, overwrite what they're using because I'm testing out a new scenario. So sometimes I'll either create another dashboard off of this and save it as an analysis to edit, or there's a really cool feature here, which is probably one of my favorites. And as you can see here, I had two tabs set up just in case the live demo went a little slow so that I could show you as well. But you can actually go to any of these tabs and you can duplicate the sheet. This is awesome because now I have the ability to do some test use cases here and decide, is it something I want to add into my actual dashboard? And now let's say I've now created everything I want to see and I want to share it out. What you can then do is publish your dashboard. And I'll replace my existing dashboard because some of my team members already have access to it. I can now publish this out. And let's just say I want to send this dashboard or this visual view to my team. I want to send it weekly to my leadership. What I'm able to do is actually share and email the report. And so I'm able to email this report to my teams. One call out is that it only emails the very first sheet because it can get very overwhelming if you're emailing them all out. So whatever you want to have as that first sheet or want to email, out, make sure it's your first sheet. So this was just a quick walkthrough of some of the different functionality that you can use. 
and I know we're at time here. So um, thank you guys all for joining. I'm going to pass it off to Jill so that she can give any last minute updates. But I hope you all had a great experience learning how to use QuickSight, learning how to use the cost intelligence dashboard and how to start customizing it and scaling it for your teams. Great, thank you so much, Ali. It was super helpful to go through all that detail. I did wanna add one point on the last uh, topic. When you're emailing, I wanted to call out that we do have a roadmap item that is coming hopefully by the end of the year or first month of uh, next year, where we'll be able to email PDF reports uh, that will allow you to see more than just that first page with the link back to the QuickSight dashboard. So that's that'll be an exciting enhancement. Um, also to everybody, thanks for your great questions and hopefully you were able to follow along and get most of this built in your own accounts as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we did record today. So I'm posting for one more uh, just reference point, um, our YouTube channel, which is where we will post the recording um, by the end of the week uh, or sooner if we get it processed before then. Uh, and we are doing <coughs> weekly workshops on how to get the most out of QuickSight. So I will also post the, the link um, in an email follow-up to you and also in the chat window. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we're doing sessions on administering QuickSight and also uh, how to get more out of the author experience. So if you're interested in learning more about how to build beautiful dashboards, um, those will be great options as well. So with that, I'll uh, say thanks for attending and hopefully you got a lot out of today's session. Have a great rest of the day.